Uh, two things in the introduction to our service today. Uh, one in our Christian church year, especially as a church that has its roots in Lutheranism, uh, just over 500 years ago on October 31st, 1517, an individual by the name of Martin Luther nailed 95 statements challenging the sale of indulgences. And he did this on October 31st because November 1st was All Saints Day, a day in the church year where the, the, the saints, those that uh, were super Christians, so to speak, were remembered. And he knew that people were going to be coming to the Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany, and the sale of indulgences tapped into the treasury of merits that the saints had accumulated. So if you didn't do enough good, you could buy an indulgence that would uh, tap into some saints' extra good works and apply it to your account or to someone else's uh, that you knew and loved account. And so he challenged that forgiveness could not be bought, but it was given by the grace of God. And so we're going to weave some of that some of Luther's thoughts into our service today under the theme, the second part of our introduction is we're going to continue our Believe series and today looking at our belief about humanity. Um, how, do we, how do we view people around us, but more importantly, how does God view people around us as loved, the ones he loves and ones that he sent Jesus for? So I pray that our time of worship today and our uh, remembrance of the Lutheran Reformation over 500 years ago, but we still live in that legacy. We're back to the forefront of the church's teaching was brought a message of grace, a message of forgiveness, a message that relies solely on the scripture alone and on Christ alone. As we look at our belief about humanity, it was interesting this week just to, to, to reflect on this 31st of October, uh, a day that's important to us who have a Lutheran heritage and background and the way that God used Martin Luther to bring back to the forefront uh, key teachings of the Christian church. Part of the Christian church for many centuries has been the Apostles' Creed. It was a summary written of the Apostles' teaching, not written by the Apostles, but written um, based on the, the key teachings that God's Spirit had given them about who God is as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Martin Luther, in his desire to have every person understand what they were confessing and make it understandable so that dads could teach it to their children and also moms, but he's usually in that setting, God's put that on us as dads and faithful moms are important too, but as the head of the household should teach these things to their children. And I want to speak in a moment together, the, just the first article of the Apostles' Creed which states our belief about God the Father being creator, and then how Martin Luther expanded on that to help us understand more in depth. And this, this sets up as we go move into um, our message today, because we're going to be looking at how does God view humanity, how do I view humanity, and does it make a difference when I confess that I am a creation of the Almighty God? It does. It, it's a very different mindset then if I remove that core teaching that God is creator and then say, well, what does humanity become if I am not a created being? And we'll unpack that in our message today. But I just want you to reflect on, as we say this, both A, who you are as a human being, and also 500 years ago, how Martin Luther understood the scripture, how God viewed us and how he viewed himself too. So let's speak together the first article and then Luther's uh, explanation to that. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. All this he does only out of fatherly, divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. 
For all this, it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. Our key verse for this week is uh, probably the easiest one you're going to memorize. We'll get to that, uh, but it's in John chapter 3, if that's any uh, hint for you. So that will be a, uh, the main verse of our focus today, but we'll look at other ones as well. As we look at this key idea, key belief, I believe all people are loved by God and need Jesus Christ as their Savior. That certainly is a truth that God developed in Martin Luther's heart and mind as he opened the pages of Scripture and God's Spirit opened those Scriptures to him to bring that back to the forefront in this series of Believe, just by kind of a way of review, and then we'll get into today's message, we're asking God's Spirit to help us think, act, and be more in line with who God has called us to be as his children by grace through faith, to be his people, to live for him, to think, let our mind and our heart and our attitude be aligned to him. Last week, um, we talked about the church and how God designed that as the primary purpose or a primary place that he accomplishes his purpose on earth. Uh, do you remember the, the Bible passage? Um, in, the, in the study guide midweek, there was two verses, but we'll let, let you off easy and just select one of them. Um, as we've done in the past, uh, Tim, if you can put that up on the screen, let's say it, and then we'll go back to the previous screen and see if we can say it without looking. Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Speaking the truth in love, we will in every respect grow to become like him who is the head, that is Christ. I kind of butchered that a little bit, didn't I? <laughs> Go back to the screen. Let's say it all one more time with a little bit of help. Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. And here's our verse for today, John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That one we can remember, right? We've, we've, I think many of us have had that in our memory for years, and probably if there's one verse that you have memorized, this is a good one to have, because it captures the message of grace and the message of God's heart and the message of eternal life that God invites you to believe with all your heart and trust all your life. Like I said, today's topic in the generally is uh, we're going to be looking at humanity. How does God view humanity? How do we view humanity? Uh, the people around us. Before we maybe get into that, I want to use this opportunity, the Reformation and a little bit of Luther's life, to just kind of ask how 500 years ago did, did Luther, like what was going on in Luther's mind and heart because how he saw himself as a human being and how he thought God saw him are important because our hearts and minds can, can understand the same thing and we want God's spirit to realign it just like he did for Luther. For those of you that don't know a whole lot about Luther, let me just try and give you the cliff notes of his life. He grew up as a Catholic. That was the predominant religion of most of Europe at the time. Religion and politics were closely enmeshed in what was known as the Holy Roman Empire, and they were headed by both the papacy and the Holy Roman Emperor. And so into this climate, Luther, uh, as the the history goes, was walking home and there was a thunderstorm and he was nearly struck by lightning and he made a vow with, with St. Anne, who was the patron saint of miners, like people who dig things out of the ground, because his dad was a miner and owned a, a number of mines in the area of Germany they lived. And he vowed, if you save me, St. Anne, I will become a monk. And so instead of becoming a lawyer like his dad wanted him to be, he became a monk and he entered a monastery as an Augustinian monk. And in that setting, the blessing that became, even though his dad was furious that his, his son gave up his law school and his dad's aspirations to become a lawyer, he used that same, God used the mind of a lawyer 
to understand and parse and write as God unfolded the pages of Scripture. Because in that day, we're so used to like our Bible apps and a paper Bible. We probably have multiple ones in our home. A, a copy of the Bible is very expensive because the, the printing press was just becoming online. And to have a Bible, it would have been a hand-copied version. But as a monk in a monastery and in a university town, he had access to a Bible. And long story short, as he began to uncover the truths of the Scripture, he realized that the teaching that was going on in the church was nowhere near the teaching of God's love and grace that was in the Scripture. Luther was taught, as well as most people, that God saw humanity as people to stick it to them. And humanity saw God as an angry judge who was willing to stick it to them. And the only way to appease God's wrath was to go on pilgrimages and pay indulgences and to live a, a life that in some way would merit the mercy of God. And so Luther was always troubled in his spirit and his conscience because he could never come to terms that he was good enough to be in the presence of a holy almighty God. And he thought for sure he was going to be condemned, condemned not just to purgatory but to hell. And purgatory was an invention of the church, was somewhere between hell and heaven, but you would languish, languish there until uh, people, either you've spent enough time or people who are still alive would buy enough forgiveness to get you out of purgatory. And so at the, the time of Luther, there was a sale of these little pieces of paper called indulgences. And the, the papacy was using the sale of those to build what we know as St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. So that's how that got built 500 plus years ago. And people thought that they could buy some forgiveness that was in this big treasury of merits that was earned by the saints. So the saints in the Catholic Church were ones that had lived an extraordinary life and had so much good works to their account that they had extra to share for people and the church was selling it off to the highest bidder, so to speak. And all these things were going on in Luther's day and in regard to his perception of how God felt about him and how he felt about God, it was very much one that he was under the fear of God, not understanding the love of God. But the pages of Scripture and the truths of Scripture, he realized that a person is right with God, not because they are so righteous, but because God's love for them is so great. And he began to understand, which is really our key truth for today, is that God loves all people, and all people need Jesus. That God's perception, and that's why we have our key verse of John 3.16, is God loves the world. And that's why he sent Jesus, that all who believe in him will not perish, will not languish in purgatory or hell, but spend an eternity in heaven. And what we appreciate about how God used a person such as Martin Luther is to bring this truth back to the forefront of the church because it had been hidden under the polity and the indulgences and all the, the false teaching of the church. And his desire wasn't to start a Lutheran church. His desire was to bring the whole church back to the teaching of grace, back to the authority of Scripture, back to the reality of faith, that our faith is centered in Christ alone as well. That we would see one another as God sees us, as individuals who are loved, individuals who need Jesus. Also at the time of Luther, and this will lead us into how, what are really the two viewpoints of humanity today? At the time of Luther was beginning a, a shift in the thinking of the day from what was maybe known as mysticism, where, where things in life were explained by, by miracles or by the spiritual or supernatural. And there was a movement that became known as the Enlightenment that things began to say, you know what, the this, this spiritual is bunk. We need to be able to figure these things out. And so you had an age of, of rationalism, people's just figuring things out and say things have to make sense, scientific discovery, a lot of great advancements in technology, etc., coming out of the 1500s and the 1600s. But what the shift became was 
It wasn't a combination always of what I'm learning by observation in the scientific realm and what I'm knowing and learning from the Bible in the biblical realm and bringing the two together, but the split began to divide even greater. Do we see that today? Right? We live in, in that reality. In this reality, the age of Darwin in the 1800s was really a byproduct of this, I have to explain the world without God being part of it. And so it wasn't trying to explain the world with God in it, but more and more what we hear the term science, and even that term has been mutated, but really sometimes science is, I'm going to explain the world apart from God, and religion is explaining the world from God. Now we could have a long discussion, I'm a firm believer that science and theology can go together if we understand science correctly, understand theology correctly. But when I try and remove a perspective of the world with God in it, I'm going to come to different conclusions about humanity. And that's what we want to talk about, many other things, but especially humanity. And we really get to the question, as this graphic illustrates, where did I come from and why am I here? And we have two opposing viewpoints. Either I'm a product of an almighty creator or I'm a product of billions of years of chance. In Minnesota, the church I was at, I had the opportunity to teach a class to the 7th and 8th graders that really came down to, if any of you wear glasses or corrective lenses, just take off your glasses for a minute. How does the world look to you right now? (laughs) I see fuzzy outlines of people. When I put my glasses on, I see things much more clearly. Do things look different when you put your glasses on? I use this as an illustration of how we view the world gives us our perspective of what we see. The first one I just want to outline briefly because I want to see how it stands in contrast with how humanity is viewed by God. And first look at humanistic humanity. What conclusions has our world come to about humanity if I remove God from the picture? This graphic, perhaps in a a little satiristic way, if I remove God from the picture, really what I have about myself is that my origins are from goo to you. Right? Without getting into the whole evolutionary timeline and the whole evolutionary progression, there there are people who are more uh, schooled in that, but in general, I come from a Uh, some sort of energy that massed together to a single cell primordial mass type thing and eventually we get all the way over billions of years to humanity today. But what that leads me to understand about myself and about really if I look at the people around me, not only here this morning but anyone I interact with, is I can say of them, you're just a product of random chance. And if you're filling in your blanks, that's the the first point under humanistic humanity. Their view of humanity is that we are all just a product of chance. That in essence, over time, all the right pieces came together to form you. If I am just a product of random chance... The evolutionary mindset says my purpose in life is simply to survive. In Darwin's theory, survival of the fittest. That those, had, those creatures that had the intellect, that adapted, that, um, that changed in a positive way or were able to kill off those that threatened them, those are the ones that survived. Now, let me just insert here, when we talk about evolution, what, what we stand opposed to is macroevolution, the change between species, like monkey to human being, etc. Changes, the fact that we're all different is sometimes called microevolution, changes within species. We're not, that, that's completely congruent with the teaching of the scripture. But I just like to maybe just define that term so we're on the, on the same page. But in that system, it's just a, it's a fight to survive. So third, then, how do I view the people around me? If my purpose in life is to survive, each one of you is a threat to my survival. 
So I'm inherently always in competition to outdo you. So you look at this list and say, if, if without God, this is how humanity is viewed. I'm a product of chance. My purpose is to survive. And other people are competition. Now, what are the potential side effects of that mindset in our culture? I'm just going to give you a few because they do have ramifications. When you think of some of the evils and atrocities as we view it from that which contradicts the teachings of Scripture and the fact that God, has, God loves us and sent his son for us, you think of abortion. If I don't believe that every life from conception is a product of the Almighty Creator, I'm more willing to get rid of it. There's a cheapening of life, a dismissal of life. If I am just one of the products of the world around me and and I realize that I have no more value than the leaf on the tree outside. That perhaps at times we sense that things in nature have more importance than humanity. Well, I can come to that conclusion if everything is just randomly chance happening, everything has intrinsically the same value. If I think of very dark eras of our world's history. If you look into the Holocaust and Nazism, a lot of it was survival of the fittest, a superior race, because if the survival of the fittest, there's got to be a superior race that eventually evolves and everything else is killed off. And so different segments of society are deemed more important than others. Racism is a byproduct of a humanistic mindset. We could go on, but you begin to see that that life and how we view humanity, it's a big deal. And we might say too, let me make this connection, that I don't want to just pietistically say, well, yeah, that's how everybody else views it out there, but I never have these viewpoints. Inside each of us is a sinful nature. And the product of a humanistic humanity, or the the cause behind a humanistic humanity is a sinful nature that doesn't want to have God part of my life. I want to be the superior one. I want to be the one that survives. I want to be the one that calls the shots. And so it's no wonder if I have no curbing of the sinful nature, I will create a culture that has a humanistic viewpoint of humanity. We can view humanity this way. But that's not how God views it. God views it in a a much different way. And as I taught this to 7th and 8th graders in Minnesota, and I'll pose the same thing to you, I simply ask, which one do you want to hold to? Which one of these says more about your value and worth. Biblical humanity says this. First of all, that all people are created by God. Sorry for the typo. I caught it later, but I just saw it. (laughs) Created it, tid. You are a creation of an almighty God. The scripture says this. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and that man became a living being. Why is this a big deal? Because throughout creation week, as Genesis begins, in the beginning, God, which is always, it stands out to me because the Bible never explains the existence of God. It always assumes the reality of God. It starts with that premise and that reality. And God, for six, five and a half days, speaks things into existence. Let there be light. Let there be water. Let there be... Uh, let there be land, let there be a separation in the water, let there be sea creatures and air creatures, let there be things that crawl along the ground and creepy things that creep on the ground. But God did not say, let there be humanity. And the Bible does not say, and there was humanity. But God stopped in his mass production and mass creation 
Still, as I look at the world around me, the heavens declare the glory of God. I, I see God's handiwork all around me. But when I see in me and I see in you and we see in each other, is God took special care above everything else in creation and said, I'm going to form this person in my image and I'm going to breathe into them my very breath. And as God did that, you became a living being. And as God made Adam and then very carefully made a helper for him named Eve, and God commanded them to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and created in them the ability to reproduce. And as the psalmist said in Psalm 139, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, that we recognize that God started the knitting project of you when you were just two cells old. And so as you look in the mirror, what you see is a product of an almighty God who puts you together so fearfully and wonderfully that even the science community can't figure everything out about the human body and how it works. So intricately made, which means as I view humanity, I see humanity as a created component of the almighty God who cared enough to put humanity into the world, not just this product of chance, go, well, let's start some goo and see what happens. God started with you and said, let's make it happen. Which gives you intrinsic value, which gives you intrinsic worth, intrinsic dignity. Which when I look around, I don't see all types of races. I see people whom God has created that have different tones, of, amounts of melatonin in their skin. We have one race on this planet called the human race. Because that's what God created. We are not involving, evolving into one part of, of humanity as a, a superior and one's an inferior. We all have value because God is your creator. As God made us and designed us to be in a relationship with him and with one another, there's a very important component that we all struggle with as well, and that's our second point about biblical humanity, is we recognize the presence of evil in the hearts of every individual. All people have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What this recognizes is people are spiritual beings. And as God designed Adam and Eve to be in a perfect relationship with him, he didn't design robots to just... I love the Lord. I will do what you want to do, want me to do. God designed a freely given worship and honoring of him. And as Adam and Eve fell into sin and did what God did not command, no longer was the image of God passed on, but rather the image of man, which is our sin nature. And so as I, as I look around, as I look in my own heart, I realize that I can't measure up. Luther recognized this. His conscience was always troubled. He didn't ever feel right with God. But yet, as the pages of Scripture opened up, he realized that, yes, I have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is what we confessed earlier, just Luther's understanding of creation. I skipped over it, but it's important just to note here. I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason, all my senses, and still takes care of them. Luther understood that. Now going back to, I recognize that I'm... I, I've fallen short of God's glory. Here's what the scripture teaches in Psalm 51. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. You see, another reason why abortion is such a big deal is because it cuts off that little one's time of grace. If I believe that that sin nature is passed on from mom and dad, that little baby in the womb needs God's grace, that's why I encourage moms who know that they're expecting, be around the Word of God, read the Word of God, listen to the Word of God. Just like studies say, listen to classical music and you'll have a smart kid, right? It's like we don't know how that infant inside of a mother's womb responds to that which they hear, but we do know that they know their mom's voice much better than they know dad's voice. 
Why is that? Because they've been hanging out with it for nine months. So mom, use your voices to share God's word even with the unborn child because God's spirit, faith comes by hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. You see, that's why those little ones are so valuable because they matter to God and they want, God wants those little ones to hear his voice. I've been sinful at birth, sinful from the time a mother conceived me. Romans 3, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile for all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Here's another anti-racial thing in the scripture. There's no difference. I don't care how fair-skinned you are or how dark-skinned you are. I don't care what your social status is. I don't care what country you came from. I don't care where you live on this planet. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You begin to see in a biblical view of humanity, you start to look past all these fake divisions between people that our culture sets up. And I begin to realize that this person is a creation of the Almighty God. And this person, too, has a sinful nature, just like I do. Luther said this and as he wrote about the, the fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer. He said, we pray in this petition that our Father in heaven would not look at our sins or deny our prayer because of them. We are neither worthy of the things for which we pray, nor have we deserved them, but we ask that he would give them all to us by grace. For we daily sin much and surely deserve nothing but punishment. So we too will sincerely forgive and gladly do good to those who sin against us. Those were his reflections on that petition that we pray so often, forgive us our sins, our trespasses, as we forgive those who sin against us. A recognition, why would Jesus include that in a prayer? Because he knows the ongoing sinful nature and battle against sin that we need God's forgiveness, which leads us into the third point. All people are loved by God. You go back to the Old Testament. Remember the promise that God gave to Abraham? He said, all nations... All nations on earth will be blessed through you. And he was referring to the promise that would be carried on through his son Isaac and then Jacob and on down the line until Jesus Christ came into this world. That God's heart from the beginning was that Adam and Eve and all people would be blessed by him and come to know him and have a relationship with him. And then in John chapter 3, verse 16, which is our key verse, for God so loved the world. There's no exception, right? Again, if you look at all the artificial divisions that are in our culture and our country, just look past all those, and God says, I don't care, again, what your external look like and your social status, etc. I love you. God so loved the world, there's no exceptions. It doesn't say, well, God so loved the world, except. Aren't you glad that phrase isn't there? But just a blanket truth God loves the world. All people are loved by God. So what does that mean for us? That I I look at, interact with a person at work, a customer, person at school, a person in my apartment complex, wherever it is, go down the list. That person is a creation of the Almighty God. That person has a sinful nature, but that person is loved by God. And we'll get to number four in just a minute, but that person's loved by God. And if that person's loved by God, that means that that person matters to God. And if that person matters to God, that person also matters to me. That person is not competition. That person isn't one that I have to outdo and that I have to find some way to survive over. That person is one that falls under the same God who loves the world. As Martin Luther reflected on, on the truth that God loves the world, there we go. Our Father who art in heaven. I think this is such a, a great reflection. We, we kind of engage, right, who art in heaven. <laughs> right? It's like we start the Lord's Prayer. It's like, oh, we're starting the Lord's Prayer. Art in heaven. And we, and, and we maybe aren't quite engaged when we say, our Father And Luther said, let's not skip over those two important words, but he says, with these words, God tenderly invites us to believe that he is our true father and that we are his true children, so that with all boldness and confidence, we may ask him as dear children, ask their dear father. It's a term of endearment. God loves you. He's your father. We're created. We sin, fall short of the glory of God. We fall under God's love. Therefore, point number four is we all need Jesus. 
All people need Jesus. Jesus came for the world. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God loved the world all-inclusive, whoever. It doesn't say except. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Or as the scriptures also say in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Or as Luther put it in the second article in his explanation, he says, I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. Remember this from your confirmation era, some of you who grew up in that system, right? That I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity. Let's just pause here for a moment, because what difference does it make when I see myself and others as created beings of the Almighty God, ones who have sinned, fall short of the glory of God, but fall under the love of God and for whom God sent Jesus, that I should be, say it with me, his own. That's a big deal. (laughs) That I should be his own. That I am a child of the Almighty God. I am not just a product of random chance and it's not goo to you, but God had me in mind when he created this world and live under him and his kingdom. You see, I'm part of a bigger entity than just the city and the country that I'm part of. I'm under God's kingdom. And what do I do under that reality? I serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. I have a heavenly home that's waiting for me. So now as I interact in the world around me, I have a much different perspective. I don't get caught up in all this identity politics. I don't get caught up in the idea that I'm better than someone else. I repent of that, and I come back to the truth that the people around me matter to God. They're loved by God, and they need Jesus, just like I do, just like I am. Do you see the contrast between a humanistic humanity and a biblical humanity? Which one would you rather live under? I'll stand on the biblical humanity. Because what I identify with is what and who I become. And as I identify with an almighty, loving God, I become who he has called me to be. And that includes being a light in this world. What would it be like if you represented this more fully to the people around you? To let them know that they are valuable because they're created. Let them know they're loved and forgiven. Let them know that Jesus came for them. I believe All people are loved by God and need Jesus as their Savior. I'm grateful that God used a person like Martin Luther to bring that truth back to the forefront. And may we be in this day, in this generation, the beacon of this truth to the people around us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for making me one of your children by faith in Jesus. Thank you for putting in front of us a picture of humanity that realizes that we are created beings of yours, made in your image. We're valuable to you. Help us to love the people around us just like you loved us. As we have been touched by your grace and your mercy, let us be the beacon to share that mercy and grace with others. Lord, thank you for your servant Martin Luther on this Reformation Day. Sinful as he was, you brought to his heart the reality of grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you for his work to bring back to the teaching of your people a message of salvation by grace, that we don't live under the terror of your law, but we live under the love of your grace. Again, let us be that beacon of hope in the world around us. 
to proclaim your message of grace and truth to those that need it. Father, all these things we ask in Jesus' name and we invite, um, or invite all of us to pray together the prayer you've taught us. And uh, we'll use a kind of shift in versions to the a little more modern version of the Lord's Prayer. So it's up on the screen if you need those words. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So God bless your day as we live under the the legacy of the, the Reformation and how God used his servant Martin Luther to bring the message of grace back to the forefront. And I'm, I'm glad he did, and I'm glad that uh, we have that truth. And I uh, pray that it stays with each of you uh, throughout your lives and into eternity. Have a blessed day and a blessed week ahead.